Welcome to my talk about grids and letters, how topography helps with learning chemistry. Studies find that students like science, but not science class. The report mentions while 81% are actually interested in science, only 37% enjoy the subject in class. Textbooks are still the most used medium in lectures. Let's take a look at an average high school chemistry book. From a designer's perspective, it gets quite obvious why students don't enjoy using this material. Its text-heavy and typographical flaws, like forced alignment and huge line height, make it hard to read. Like all printed books, it teaches based on static images, without a chance to explore how things work or interact with the content. By the way, the textbook you are looking at right now costs $120. In my semester project, I decided to try a different approach, to make learning chemistry more accessible, easier to understand and maybe even fun. This was the beginning of the Digital Chemistry Lab, a web-based tool that can be used as teaching material for high school students to learn about the periodic table, look up details about chemical elements, or simulate chemical reactions via drag and drop. Let's focus on the periodic table first. This is a standard visualization often used in school books, and it's really overwhelming. We have color, lots of it actually but also big letters, medium-sized numbers, small bold numbers, little bit smaller text, and even smaller numbers. Why does it look like that? Well, this is what I call an expert view. It has a high complexity and needs great previous knowledge, but is totally reasonable if you are experienced with the subject, similar to a pilot and an airplane cockpit. But for students, we need a learner's view that is simplified, readable, gives orientation and shows information in bits after each other, not all at once. We can achieve that by structuring information and using typography. So what do we have here? The color shows which group the element belongs to, for example transition metals. The letters TL are called a symbol and represent the element's name, in this case thallium. There are some fun names like Einsteinium and, for the German audience, Darmstadtium. But back to business. The atomic number represents the number of protons. The atomic weight shows the ionic mass. And last but not least, the electrons per shell tell us how the electrons are distributed. Oh, and some elements also have a certain number of so-called Lewis dots. What does this mean? The symbol is essential to identify an element. While groups work like categories, atomic number, weight, Lewis dots and electrons per shells are fused. Many people don't know that there are four views of the periodic table. Standard, atomic, ionic, and Lewis, showing basically the same content with different focus. If you are a Mac OS user, this principle may sound familiar to you, because that's similar to how views in the Finder work. You are always seeing the same files, but the attributes shown are different. After sorting this out, we tweak the design. These are the symbols for lithium, thallium and iridium. As you can see, the capital I and the small l look exactly the same. It's hard to tell if the text says FL or FI. That's why it's important to choose a typeface where the letters I and L are easily distinguishable, so students don't get confused. Also keep in mind that we have to make this work for four different views. That's why we use a grid in order to avoid that the text jumps too much when the user changes the view. Some data also differs in length. For example, atomic weight varies between 3 and 6 figures. That's why I use tabular lining figures. They all have the same width, which helps us to calculate how much space the numbers will need. And that is what it looks like in the end. The standard view is used most of the time in chemistry class, so it's pre-selected. But the three other views are also available if needed. And of course, we can highlight one, or if needed, also two groups. But that's not all. Behind every abstract letter combination hides an element with different characteristics, like osmium, one of the world's rarest metals. What distinguishes the digital chemistry lab most from a textbook are the elements fact sheets, and how students can navigate through them. We've seen before that elements with similar characteristics are placed in groups. 
Viewing an element in detail still lets you see the neighboring elements. This makes orientation much easier and also helps to memorize the order of the elements. A miniature periodic table shows students where they are right now and gives them the possibility to quickly jump to another element. Otherwise, viewing different elements would mean to open a page, close it again, open the next one and so on. If I designed every elements page like this, they would look quite similar and it would be very likely for students to lose track. To make sure all 118 pages are easily distinguishable, every page gets its own color scheme. Thankfully, I can automate this task and I don't have to do it by hand. For every element, Wikimedia Commons provides a beautiful image, which is then used to grab the dominant color via the color teeth script and apply it in four gradations. That's how I get 118 pages that follow the same structure, but still look individual and adapt perfectly to their content. Another part of the content are tables with the chemical properties of the chosen element. Students need this additional information for calculating or to substitute a formula. In my experience, when it comes to tables, the design community parts in designers who love to design tables and those who hate it with passion. I really like designing them, so let's start. I'm not a chemist myself, so all text data I use comes from the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. It's unformatted and looks like this. First of all, we need to get the formulas and figures right. Starting with a little cleanup. Right now there are hyphens used instead of minus. You can easily check if you are using the right one by placing a plus next to it. While the hyphen is positioned too low and looks too short, the minus fits perfectly. After a bit of research I learned that some of these numbers are actually meant to be superscripted. You might notice how thin the numbers look now. That's because force superscript was used instead of the real glyphs. Now it comes in handy that I chose a quality typeface, which comes with beautiful superscripted numbers. There are just two more things to make the text more readable. Using separators for large numbers and adding some space here and there. We are now ready to style the whole table. Tables represent data that belongs together. But here, physical properties like the melting point are mixed up with atomic properties like the atomic mass. Sorting the entries by category makes finding the information you are looking for much easier. We can also add describing headlines. You can see that there's a lot of space between some entries and their values. That makes it hard for the eye to follow the line. Normally I would simply align the first column to the right. But that creates a new problem, because now the lines are jumping strangely. Instead we align the text back to the left and use lines as little helpers for the reader's eyes. Small caps solve the problem of cutting descenders and help creating clear, easy to follow lines. Adding color to the table gives it a final touch. Do you remember the sequence of numbers we saw in the beginning? It tells us that an osmium atom has six shells with a certain number of elements on each. Seeing only the plain numbers won't give students an idea of the underlying model especially because electrons aren't static. The closer they are to the atom, the more they spin around. That's why I visualize the electrons to accompany the textual information. And as a little extra, I animate them to show their behavior. After so much knowledge and theory, it's time to talk about the fun part of chemistry. Ask what they like most, students usually answer the experiments. But many chemical reactions can't be shown in class because of limited resources or for safety reasons. Also, in times of homeschooling, many parents tend to get a little nervous when their kids ask, Mom, can I create copper iodide in the kitchen sink? The lab space gives students the opportunity to simulate chemical reactions on a molecular level. This is what students see when they use the lab space for the first time. I have to admit, I have a weak spot for crafting illustrated empty states because nothing is less inviting than grey emptiness when using a new tool. Besides welcoming first-time users, a well-made empty state also explains how to use a feature without lengthy onboarding. When you are still learning, it's easy to get lost. That's why the lab space offered so-called guided reactions, where students get little hints while experimenting with molecules. Let's try this out and create Cooper Iodine.
The element we need is already highlighted and can be placed in the reaction area. After adding iodine, we can see the two chemicals react. Students often can't link what they learn in chemistry classes with the world they live in. So guided reactions always end with some information where the reaction product occurs in nature, everyday life or the industry. I hope you enjoyed learning about chemistry and typography as much as I did. Thanks for listening. Thank you.